This is our uh, fourth equipping hour in James chapter, chapters 3 and 4, and uh, this morning we're going to be looking at verses 7 to 10. So if you would like, you can grab your Bibles and open to James chapter 4, and I'm going to just pray before we dive into this incredible paragraph. Lord, thank you so much for equipping hour. Thank you for this church and for every opportunity we have to, to grow. Lord, we want to be more like your son. We want to be conformed to your image. And it's our desire, Lord, to, to um, bring you glory and honor through holiness. It's our desire to glorify you and honor you by living a life, by manifesting righteousness, by living in such a way that you would be pleased and that the, the world would be able to see our good deeds and glorify you on the day when you return. And to grow in respect to our salvation can only come from your word. And so that's why we study it. But Lord, as we've been learning from James chapter, chapters 3 and 4, I, I know that it's very easy to study your word and to understand its truth and even be able to trace out some reasonably logical implications and obligations on our life and still be able to fall short of applying those truths and to fall short of living them. And Lord, I know that we can all, we probably all, all of your children who've been studying th these texts, we've probably all been convicted in one way or another of, of potential worldliness and inconsistency in our lives. And so we come before you this morning, we come before you acknowledging that um, we do long to know your word, but we also realize that, um, of course, your word is sufficient by way of content, by way of revelation, but to merely study it without greater grace would not be enough. And so we're just acknowledging this morning, Lord, that we need a greater grace. Uh, we need your grace to produce in us a heart that jealously longs for you you jealously long for our whole heart, our whole mind, all of our will, and, um, and Lord, we are so thankful that we have seen in our hearts a transformation. Those who are, are your children, we've seen a radical transformation from loving the world to, to loving you, and at the same time, Lord, we, we are still in process, and we, uh, we still see areas where we are worldly, where we are self-reliant, where we are proud and where we can find in our hearts an impulse and, and a, a bending at times toward, toward a selfishness, toward our own comfort, and toward our own glory. And so, Lord, we need a greater grace. We need the grace that you've been teaching us about, and uh, we just thank you for this paragraph that's going to show us how to get there. And so I pray, Lord, that as we look at this paragraph, that your spirit would Grant that we would not just learn these truths and write down a few notes and take some mental inventory, but walk away unchanged. I pray instead that we would walk away empowered by your spirit, strengthened with a greater grace to actually, in humility, move forward into um, a greater godliness in our inner man. So, Lord, we just thank you for here this this cure we have, this cure we have for any latent worldliness in our, in our inner man, and we just thank you for your goodness to us to give us such incredible resources in Christ and in your word. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, first thing I need to mention is James chapter 4, verse 7, uh, does not begin with a notable introduction that we, we are used to seeing. And if we study the book as a whole, you'll notice that um, the sections that go from chapters 2 through 5, uh, they virtually all begin with a few short list of introductions. Um, you, you know, you might have, for example, uh, my brothers and sisters, or even just brothers and sisters, or even just brothers. But that's a very common, typical way to, to begin a section. You might have a question or questions being asked, and then that's a way to introduce a new topic, a new section, a new test of a living faith. Uh, he also begins a few sections with anyone among you, and he also begins them with above all, once, and come now. And so 
if you look at chapters 2, verses 1 through 4, if you look at chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, if you look at chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 13, 4, 1, 4, 11, 4, 13, 5, 1, 5, 7, 5, 12 to 14, and 5, 19, that's what you see. And those become very classic ways that James begins a new section. And he says, here's a new section. I'm going to give you a new test for your faith. So let's look at this. How does your faith measure up to this particular text? Well, we see that in chapter 4, verse 1. He asks not one question, but two. What's the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Is not the source your pleasures that wage war on your members? And that begins a section that really goes all the way through verse 10. And so I, I did break it up, and I, and I did so knowingly because the implications of what we learned last week, chapters 4, verses 1 through 6, are explained in verses 7 through 10. It's important to remind ourselves of that because when we look at 7 through 10, we cannot separate that from chapters 4, verses 1 through 6. 1 through 6 goes together, and it's logically, directly, logically related to verses 7 to 10. He's not beginning a new section Instead, he's moving on to develop what would be the necessary exhortation for us in light of the truth of verses 1 through 6. So if you remember, last week we looked at this and we, we looked at the, uh, really the exposure of a religiously worldly heart. And you remember he's talking to those who are religious, he's talking to um, believers, uh, professing believers, and the question is, for those who profess to have faith, is their profession legitimate? Is it a legitimate profession? Is it a real profession? And so he works through, with some questions, he works through uh, where um, tensions and quarrels and conflicts come. And what he's doing here is he's exposing, really, a worldly heart in a religious context. This is true because, as we see in verse um, 3, one of the reasons why they don't have certain things that, that they want is because, not because they don't ask God. In, in fact, a lot of times they might even ask God for these things, so they're very religious. But, verse 3 says, you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. And he proceeds to call them adulteresses because they are, their religion is actually a means of getting their own selfish idols. And so that's an exposure of, hey, there's a heart in turmoil here because it has something that it wants, and it's not receiving what it wants. So there's turmoil, there's conflict, there's agitation, there's animosity. And so this exposure brings him to this conclusion in verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? I mean, you can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God at the same time. You cannot love the world and love God at the same time. You either love the world or you love God. And so he says in verse 4, Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself or literally establishes himself, sets himself forward, presents himself an enemy of God. So he puts himself forward as an enemy of God because he has a friendship, an alliance, a loyalty, a draw, a love, an attraction to the world. And so this person who is turning his religion into a means of getting worldliness is exposed as a false professor. A person who professes to love the Lord Jesus Christ and their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is a really savvy and religious way to get what they want in the world. That, 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 that profession is null and void. And so he goes on to explain in verses 5 and 6, and this is where we ended last week. Do you not know, or sorry, do you think that the scriptures speak to no purpose? In other words, do you think they speak vainly? And remember, this is still James talking, so you can just ignore the quotes there in the NAS. James says, God jealously desires the spirit, lowercase s, the, the human spirit, which he, he made to dwell in us. God jealously wants all of you. He wants all of your heart. He wants all of your soul. He wants all of your desires. He does not want your heart terminating on the world. He wants your heart chasing after him. Whatever, you, whatever your heart values and whatever you put the greatest treasure in, the greatest value, wherever that lands, there your heart will go also. Whatever I put the highest value on, my heart, my inner man, my drive, everything about me is going to pursue whatever I put the highest value on. And so 
Jesus explains that in Matthew chapter uh, 5, verse um, 19 to 21. And James here is basically saying the same thing. He's saying God jealously desires your whole spirit because a, a religiously worldly heart has a spirit that's going after something else and it's turning a, a profession of worship of God into a means of selfish gain. Fortunately, verse 6, but God gives a greater grace. And therefore it says, so now he's finally getting to the quote that he introduced in chapter, in verse 5, 5a, five talking about scripture. Scripture doesn't speak vainly. Well, of course it doesn't. Here's what it says, 6b. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And that's the solution. That's the answer. If we see worldliness in our heart, and now, again, we're talking about a test of a living faith. If someone's profession of their love for Christ is, is characterized by turning that relationship into, into a means of getting the world, their profession has been exposed as fraudulent. But even for somebody whose heart loves the Lord and they, they, they don't want Christ for something else, they want Christ because they want Christ to be glorified and honored in their lives. That, that's, this, this text ends up being an encouragement. I remember uh, even as a young convert being so overwhelmed with the thought that, Lord, I, I've, all I can do with this life is mess it up. And I've proven that for 19 years. If somehow you could actually get glory for yourself through my life, that would be awesome. I'm so thankful for that. That sentiment was obviously not coming from me. It was coming from the Lord. It was a, it was, there was a grace given there. And he reminds us that there's a greater grace. So when we see worldliness in our heart, we need a greater grace. And there is a greater grace. And then he quotes Proverbs 3, 34. God's opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So, Pride makes us God's enemy. Humility makes us his ally and him ours. We are his ally. He's our ally when we are humble. And so, what does that even mean? This morning I want to look at this next paragraph because this next paragraph really spells it out for us. You know, it's interesting. Sometimes humility can be misunderstood. I remember as a young Christian, hearing the, the idea being, you know, humility is that one virtue that you can never know you possess. Have you ever heard that? It's like, as soon as you think you're humble, oh, there you're not humble. It's like, oh, man, I'm finally humble. Ah, see, now you're proud. Because see, you knew, you knew you were humble, so obviously you're not humble. <laughs> and it says, catch 22, you could never actually be humble and know it. Well, if that's the case, that's a real problem, because that's an actual command. If we skip all the way to verse 10, Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. So if it's something you could never know that you can do, then we've been given a command that we can never know we're actually going to obey. Have you obeyed verse 10? Couldn't know. Hopefully I have because I don't know. If I did know, I know I've disobeyed it. That's just ridiculous. It's nonsense. It's just an unhelpful definition. It's not even biblical. Um, what I love to think about is, is Moses writing the Torah, and he says Moses was the most humble man um, alive. It's like... You know, you kind of, you can, depending on what your view of inspiration is, you, you just kind of imagine, did he just write that on the page, on the page, on some scroll, and be like, really? <laughs> That's amazing. You know, he just didn't know. Uh, I, I don't, I don't tend to think that. I think that Moses understood what humility was, and he was just overwhelmed at the Lord, what the Lord was producing in his life. Um, it's interesting. Sometimes we think about humility, and we think about it as, um, sometimes we think about it as a personality trait. Um, somebody who is um, soft-spoken and somebody who's timid. Now, if I use the word timid, of course, that could be a personality trait or it could just be um, an area of disobedience. Like Paul says to Timothy, God did not give us a spirit of timidity. And so that's not a personality. That's actually a sin. It could be even vices have sometimes been called, have been equated with humility, like passivity or slowness to obey. Or it could just be an unbiblical, an abiblical category, like just emotional. You know, a humble, a humble person is very emotional. Well, or a humble person is not emotional. You could, you could define it either way. Both are wrong. Um, um, there are um, emotions that go with humility, and there, uh, and there are that follow humility, uh, and there are those emotions can also be lacking in a true display of humility, as we'll find in this very paragraph. Um, some of 
some of my most passionate moments of my life, the most emotional moments of my life, would be uh, the farthest from what we see in verses 7 through 10. And we could turn right around and say there are some very emotional moments in, my, in our lives that could be a direct reflection of obedience to the commands in verses 7 through 10. And so it's not a state of emotion. It's not a personality trait. It's not passivity. It's not timidity. It's not passivity or, or being soft-spoken. What humility is and the path to get there are spelled out in no uncertain terms in James chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. And I wanted to take a long time to get to that statement because I wanted you to appreciate how profound James 4, 7 through 10 really is. This is like a gold mine. It's just a treasure because if you, if you understand what James is doing in verses 1 through 6, and if your spirit is prodded and convicted about any area of worldliness and desire to make sure that you avoid worldliness that God saved you out of and he continues to purify you from whatever worldliness might be, you might see a, t- a penchant toward worldliness, a tendency toward worldliness in your own heart, some sort of love or attraction. You hear the command or you hear the encouragement. He gives a greater grace. God's opposed to the proud because grace to the humble. And you say, amen, now what do I do? How do I get there? What does that look like? Therefore, verse 7. So the therefore in verse 7 moves on to develop in a very reasonable fashion. Here's what it looks like to pursue a greater grace. This is the path to humility. It's a path of humility toward greater grace. So humility is actually demonstrable. It it looks like following this path. Humility is going to be marked by obedience to these commands, and this is the path toward a greater grace. If you want greater grace in your life, follow this path. I mean, if you're in Christ, we've been shown untold grace. There is infinite amount of grace in Jesus Christ. But there's really more grace to be experienced in our current state than just the grace of being justified. And even the grace in our current state that we've already experienced in how much sanctification we've been the, had the privilege of experiencing and being a part of. There's more. There's a greater grace. And so this path to humility is the path to, to get to a greater grace. And so he just starts to spell out, hey, listen, if, if, if God gives a greater grace and the scriptures say God's opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble, then... Here you go. Therefore, let's get after it. So what, what the outline is, it's a very simple outline because there's, um, there's about nine commands that are listed in this paragraph. I listed them for you in seven, in seven points on this outline. Uh, why seven? Well, really because in verse nine, three of them stack up with no separate modifiers. And be miserable, mourn, and weep in verse 9. So that became one point. Those are all synonyms, and so we'll look at those together. So the nine verbs end up being seven points, and I'm just going to walk through them one at a time. And I want that to be in your mindset that this is the path of humility. This is the definition of humility, and it's the path toward a greater grace. So as we look at these, these commands, think about it in that fashion. So that in your heart, you're, you're actually before the Lord saying, Lord, I want to follow this path. I am in desperate need of greater grace. And so this is a protection for me to stay on this path of humility to that greater grace. Number one, submit to God. Submit to God. Verse seven, therefore, submit to God. Submission is to order yourself under. It's a, it's a word that could be used in a lot of different contexts. It's used in homes of parents to children. It's used in the workplace of um, slaves, uh, masters and sla- to slaves. Uh, the, the slaves submit to the masters. Uh, children submit to parents. It's used in military of a lesser rank submitting to a superior rank. And so there's a, an ordering yourself under. So literally you could say, order yourself under God. Place yourself under God. It's interesting, the, um, he uses a, a synonym here. It's interesting in verse, um, verses 6 and 7, he uses the word for uh, stand against, um, submit, and then oppose. In verse 6, 
It says God is opposed to the proud. He stands against. In verse 7, you're supposed to submit, place yourself under. And then the second one we're going to look at here, resist the devil, it means to stand opposed to. And so these, these are all synonyms here. Uh, well, I guess that's not the right word, synonyms, but to submit to God and uh, standing opposed to Satan, those are synonymous phrases. That's the better way to say it. It's a synonymous phrase. So what does it mean to submit to God? It means to resist the devil. What does it mean to resist the devil? It means to submit to God. These two commands, I mean, there's, there's no separate um, modifier here. He just says, number one, submit to God. Number two, resist the devil, stand against the devil, oppose the devil. And it's interesting, when you think about the position that we must take to God, it's placing ourselves under, coming under his authority, coming under his rule, coming under his will. And the position to Satan is one of opposition, standing against, opposing, resisting. It's the same, there, there is a synonym here between the word resist, and then in verse 6, God is opposed. Those are synonyms, not the same word, but synonyms. So God's position to the proud is the same position and the same stance we must have toward Satan. It's one of opposition, oppose the devil. Stand against him, oppose him, resist him. And this would include fleeing temptation, right? 2 Timothy 2.22, uh, flee youthful lusts. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee fornication. Um, the, the fleeing temptation is clearly part of what it means to resist Satan. To resist the devil is to resist his temptations, his tactics, his, his wiles, his machinations. Uh, fill in whatever word is helpful for you to think of. His devices to dishonor God in your life and ruin you. God... Um, Satan wants to ruin you. Satan wants to ruin your physical life. He wants to ruin your spiritual life. I was reminded of that in a very tragic way this week. On Monday, I got a text from a dear friend, a daughter in the faith, and uh, her brother. Um, her brother was a, you know, an acquaintance of mine. He came to a church that I used to pastor at for several months, and we we got together on a regular basis over the course of about three months. Got together probably six or eight times, and just talked about truth, started talking through Romans, and started talking about his life and his, where he stands before the Lord. And apparently he kind of, this last year, kind of cleaned up his life. But um, she texted me on Monday morning and said that uh, her, her brother was found in a, in a car, dead, overdosed. And it just struck me. I thought about that. I thought about those conversations what would have otherwise been just a normal season of ministry, a normal couple of months in ministry. Just a friend I'm sharing the gospel with doesn't understand truth, in desperate need of Christ. And Satan would just love to laugh at our demise. He loves to ruin people just for the perverse fun of it. And he loves to defame the glory of God in any way he can. And so, one and two need to go together here. Submit to God and resist the devil. These need to go together. And I would imagine, if you're thinking, if you're understanding what James is doing here with this statement, resist the devil, you probably think, well, okay, resist the devil, and that means resist temptation. Well, what gives? Every time I resist temptation... Every time I push back on an urge toward worldliness, it seems to get stronger. But look at the verse. It says in verse 7, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So now what do we do? What does that mean? What does it mean, resist the devil and he will flee from you? It may feel like the more you resist, the more he pursues and the more difficult it becomes to resist him. And and inevitably, there is a truth to this in the sense that that's what it feels like. There, there can be a, a truth to that because, um, quite honestly, sometimes we resist with our own resources. And so I was thinking about this. The, the, uh, there was a scenario where we were on family vacation one time, and 
we were uh, we had a hotel uh, room like a kind of like a little individual yurt type thing, a little cabin cam uh, camping type situation, and uh, we had rented this little spot, and uh, we we started unloading. And uh, the Yates were there. It was snowing that night, I think, right? So we were unloading. I remember getting luggage out, setting it in the snow. The boys, are, are they, they take their first, first lap into this little yurt with all the gear. And, um, and I come in, and so they, they were all coming back out the, the door, and I'm grabbing some stuff to go in for the first time. Well, everybody was out, and I'm coming up the front steps. The door closes. I get there. It's locked. The key's inside. Now, this has already been a long day. I was probably already annoyed. And at this point, I'm such a godly man that I know I'm going to resist. I'm resisting because I'm a godly Christian dad. So we, uh, we find out the key is not in the car. It's inside. We fiddle around with the door. We fiddle around. I mean, you know, just, I'm, not a, I'm not a locksmith. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a criminal. I have no skill. I can't get into this place. I'm just, it's just over. And so we're, we have no solutions. So we go back to the front desk. Of course, it's after hours. There's no one manning the desk. There's just a number to call. After hours, call this number. We call the number. No one answers. So finally, we just get in the car with half of our gear and drive down across the highway. We go to the next hotel. I get a quote on a room. It's like a couple hundred dollars. And, uh, and I'm like, uh, I, cannot, I cannot bear paying for two hotel rooms. Uh, so we just decided, so I'm, I'm, at this point, I'm, I'm still trying to resist, failing miserably. I'm trying to resist the temptation to be angry. I jump in the car, I go flying back across. I, I, we, we go back to the yurt, and I, I'm sitting there, and I get out to, to, to walk around, try to figure out, okay, we gotta figure out how to, how to, how to get in this place. And um, April has the wherewithal to actually just start praying. And so April's in the car, praying. I'm, I'm storming around this little yurt, resisting. And we walk around the back of the yurt, and there's this, there's this window into the tiny little window uh, that goes into the bathroom. And, uh, and this little yurt thing is on the, 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 the joist that on the, the, the starting floor height inside is quite high. So this window is way up there. And, um, and I'm thinking, that's about a Derek-sized window. So I, I, get a, I, get a, uh, I get a suitcase, and I stand on the suitcase. I put Derek on my shoulders, and we kind of just force him through. And he goes into the, the window, goes through, grabs the key, and locks the door, and then we all sleep happily ever after. And I'm just so excited about my ability to resist the devil. And April's asking me, why were you so angry? Not why were you so angry, like she didn't know the circumstances. Why aren't you trusting the Lord? And it's interesting, sometimes we resist the devil and I'll put it in quotes. Sometimes we resist the devil, and we resist in the flesh. We resist with human means. We resist by relying on our own ability. And when we resist in that fashion, of course, this verse is going to feel like it's not true. Because the verse says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But guess what? The moment I rely on my own ability, the moment I rely on my own strength in order to resist, it's the opposite of resisting. Satan has me. He loves for me to be worldly, and I'm never more worldly than when the pride of life is telling me, you're a good godly dad, you can resist the temptation to be angry, and there's no truth being believed, there's no mind renewal, there's no submission to the promise of God, and there's no belief that I have no ability to fight this temptation on my own. Thankful, so thankful for the resources I have in Christ. Nope. There I am resisting in the flesh. Meanwhile, my wife is praying, and that's where it gets you. Of course, it doesn't feel like the verse is true, but it's not because it's not true. It's because that's not what it means to resist. When I resist in the flesh, I am in Satan's will. That's where Satan wants me. That's the opposite of resisting. I'm of no usefulness relying on my own strength. I'm in, I, I would be just like an unbeliever in that moment where I'm relying on my own strength. I would be just like an unbeliever, according to 2 Timothy 2, who is enslaved to do the will of Satan. I have no ability to combat that when I'm 
relying on myself. So resisting the devil uh, must be understood as resisting the devil in with God's means. So let's go back to verse seven now. And I want you just to think about it that way. Just think about maybe an equal sign is not quite accurate because obviously there's different connotations between submitting to God and resisting the devil. Those have different connotations. But there is an equal sign between them in the sense that there's no such thing as resisting the devil without submission to God. How do I resist the devil? By submitting to God, coming under God's commands, coming under his authority, coming under his will, not your will, but mine. Believing the truths that he said. And so that's important. That's critical. To obey number two requires us to obey number one and number three and four and five and so on. Okay, so let's keep moving here. And as, you work, as I work through these, hopefully that becomes more clear as we look at these commands. We don't want to take any of these commands in isolation from one another. Sometimes that leads to confusion because sometimes we can have an idea of resisting the devil in isolation of James 4, 7 to 10, and that becomes um, unhelpful at times. We could have a, for instance, the next one, verse 8, this is number 3, draw near to God. Draw near to God can have radically uh, uh, different connotations in our mind than are in James' mind when he pens this command because he tells us what it means to draw near to God. And some things might come to our mind that have nothing to do with what James describes. The, the Christian mystic comes to verse 8, says, draw near to God, and just can't wait to say, man, I can't wait to see what that feels like. What's it feel like to draw near to God? As we're about to find out, usually what it feels like is misery. <laughs> verse 9, be miserable, mourn. And weep. Sometimes I've had to explain that to young Christians, and it just it's 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 incredible how refreshing that is to be reminded. You know what? Sometimes you're never closer to God than when you feel the most miserable because your flesh just you just said no to your flesh. You just slit the throat of some monster that you didn't even realize you'd been feeding for years. And in the process of killing sin, putting it to death, it might feel, it might feel miserable. It might feel like mourning. It might feel like weeping. And you might be the closest to God you've ever, than you've ever been. Draw near to God. Consider this relationship between verses 7 and 8. Drawing near to God requires submission to God and opposition to Satan. Drawing near to God can think about verse 8 in light of what comes in 8b and c. Next two commands are cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. So now think about drawing near to God, not just in connection with submitting to God and resisting the devil. Also think about it with sanctifying your, your life, cleansing your hands, purifying your heart, drawing near to God equals submission to him. It equals opposing Satan, and it equals your sanctification. That's what it means to draw near to God. We're not talking about Thomas Akempis contemplating your navel in your camel hair robe, sleeping on a bed of nails as you wash dishes in the monastery. We're talking about sanctification, actually becoming more like God. Actually becoming more holy. That's what it means to draw near to God. Think about this for a second. Think about the mindset of Satan. And we've talked about this, but let's just, let's just remind ourselves of, of what we know to be true. The mindset of Satan, and I'm going to get this from Matthew 16. Jesus calls Peter Satan for good reason. you remember why? In Matthew 16, verse 24, um, I'm sorry, verse 23, Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. So Jesus calls Peter Satan because he's setting his mind on man's interests. He's self-absorbed, self-interested. So he's very Satan-like, if you will. If he'd been setting his mind on the things of God, on God's interest, on God's priorities, on God's will, he wouldn't have called him Satan. 
That's where it should have been, but that's not where I was. Think about for a second the, the mindset of the flesh. So just hold on to that thought. That's the mindset of Satan. Now think about the mindset of the flesh. And I'm thinking of Romans chapter 8. And you don't have to turn here. Just If you want to listen, that's great. But I'm going to go ahead and read it straight out of verses 5 through 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Here's what Paul writes. For those who are according to the flesh, and when he uses that phrase, he's describing somebody whose life is in accord or in conjunction with the flesh. Those who are according to the flesh, their lifestyle is according to the flesh. They live according to the flesh. Those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. They think about fleshly things. If your life is carnal, your mindset is carnal. If your life is fleshly, that means natural, according to what you are born with, this spiritually dead, spiritually you're not alive, you're not responsive. So what is your mindset? Your mindset, what you're focused on, what you think about, what you contemplate, it's not inactive, it's not dead in the physical sense. It's alive physically, but it's dead spiritually. All you think about are carnal things, fleshly things. But the opposite is, those who are according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. Think about that. The carnal mindset is hostile to God. Just like Satan's mindset, self-absorbed, not interested in the things of God. The carnal mindset is set on the flesh. It's hostile toward God. There's animosity toward God. It's an, there's an enmity with God. Why? Well, Paul gives us the answer. Very next phrase. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. It doesn't come under I mean, that's exactly what James just told us to do. Come under God. Subject yourselves to God. Submit to God. And he says, the mindset of the flesh does not subject itself to the law of God. And that's why it's hostile to God, because it's resisting God, opposing God. So now I ask Paul the question, well, then why doesn't it subject itself to the law of God? Why does the mindset on the flesh not come under God's law? Well, he answers that question in the very next phrase. For it's not even able to do so. The mindset on the flesh does not even have the ability to come under God's law. It's an animosity. It's opposed to it. It's alive to the world, alive to the flesh, alive to Satan, dead to God, dead to his law, dead to righteousness, dead to obedience. And he concludes in verse 8 with this, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You put those two passages together and you think about the mindset of Satan, you think about the mindset of the flesh, and you realize whew, they are one. And that's why it's not surprising when Paul says, and you can just listen to this, listen to what Paul says to Timothy. I, I mentioned it earlier. 2 Timothy chapter 2, when he's describing the relationship of the sons of uh, this world they are enslaved to do the will of Satan. Here's what it says in verse 24, speaking of the Lord's bondservant. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Hmm. If perhaps God may grant them, those who are in opposition, those who are opposed to truth, those who are opposed to God, opposed to his law, their animosity toward God, they love the world, if perhaps God might grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses. It's like kind of like this gets sobered up all of a sudden. They just get sobered up and all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute. And they might escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. You realize now, if the, this is the mindset of Satan, self-absorbed, not interested in the things of God, Here's the mindset of the flesh. I think about the things of the flesh. I am opposed to the things of God. I don't submit to the law of God because I can't submit to the law of God, and I cannot please God. Those are one and the same. So what does Satan have to do to get me enslaved to his will? Just do what I want. Do what I want naturally. I am carnal, and I am enslaved to do his will. 
He would love for nothing more than for me to ruin my own life by doing what I want naturally. Loving the world, enslaved to my own self-love, hating God, hating truth, hating righteousness. No wonder, no wonder that James looks at the religiously worldly heart and says, oh, there's a greater grace. Praise God for verse 6. There's a greater grace. And that's why he's showing us what he's showing us here in verse 8, because he says, draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. Believer, think about this for a second. You, you see, what, you know what you were saved out of. You were enslaved to do the will of Satan, and you loved the world, and you hated the things of God. And you saw him transform your life so that you have, a, have new desires. Do not ever, don't, don't go back there. Don't, don't fall prey to the doubt that, you know what, I think God's a, opposed to me. He is only opposed to you in your pride. He's only opposed to you in your pride. When, when, you, when you acknowledge, wow, Lord, I'm dealing with some worldliness here. This is beyond my pay grade. This is beyond my ability. And you go to him broken. And you go to him empty-handed. That's humility. And he's saying to us, draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. God's not opposed to you because of you. He would only be opposed to you because of pride. He's telling you, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. Obviously, if you draw near to him because you want something besides his glory and his righteousness and the gospel to be lived out in your life, well, that's what's indicted back in verses 4 and 5. This is a drawing near to God for the resource of grace that we don't have to actually see a cure for our worldly heart. We live in a world where self-love is, has been exalted even in religious circles. And um, I remember a friend who I was trying to mention to her that, that in, the, you know, in the last days, Men are going to be the religion, church, the church, the Christian church is going to be marked by those who are uh, described by as those who are self. They love themselves, lovers of self, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And I remember reading that paragraph from Second Timothy, chapter three, to her. And her parents were uh, leaders in a church down the road, and they were having some problems, and and they wanted me to get involved. And so I was just kind of just trying to encourage them. And they say, hey, can you meet with our daughter? And trying to encourage her. And, and I remember when I read that paragraph, she said, self-love is wrong? I'm like, yeah. Read the paragraph one more time. And she's like, is that your Bible? Yeah. And I, I'll never forget, she literally took a phone out. I mean, she had a Bible, she had her own Bible, and she had a Bible on her phone. She took her phone out to take a picture of my Bible. I think she actually thought that that paragraph was added. She was expecting to see it like handwritten in John Anderson's handwriting. Um, just, I, it just, it, it, it caused me to cringe because it reminds me of, that's the religious worldly heart. She's growing up in a church. Her parents are leaders, quote unquote, in a church. And she doesn't even know that self-love is wrong. Every time we choose to serve self, to please self, to perform one's own personal will, we're actually reinforcing in our minds the lie that I should get what I want, I should get to do what I want, I should get to do what I want, when I want it. Verse 8 is so, just, it's so against the grain of self-love. Draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. And that means cleanse your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. God's nearness is not a mystical experience. It's a sanctifying reality. Maybe it's helpful to even say it this way. Drawing near to God is something that you, it's not something that you feel. It's something you experience by way of sanctification. And, and sometimes it's helpful to even re remind ourselves, if, you're, if there's a uh, mystic within, 
uh, that just wants to feel a certain way, I mean, we all, we all want to feel good, right? So naturally, we're going to start loading the Christian experience with the feelings that we want to have. And sometimes it's helpful to remind ourselves, well, what does it feel like to draw near to God? Well, it looks like, it feels like cleansing your hands, purifying your heart. It feels like being miserable, mourning, and weeping. There, there's a brokenness to it because of the potential uh, danger we are to the Lord, how we've grieved him. And so there's grief, pain, burden. That's what it feels like to draw near to God. Let's look at those next two because this really spells out what it means to draw near to God. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Uh, everybody, turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. Just before the proverb that James just quoted, we have a very helpful statement about what it looks like to draw near to God. Proverbs chapter 3. And this would be another indicator that these Proverbs certainly are arranged with, 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 a deliberate, with deliberate themes. Because James quotes Proverbs 3.34 in just two verses earlier, we read, For the devious are an abomination to the Lord. Abomination is something that's abominable, it's detestable, it's loathsome. His stomach turns, his righteous indignation flares up with perfection at something so abominable. And um, Leviticus 18 says that uh, homosexuality is abominable. Proverbs 16 says the man who is lofty in his own thinking, the arrogant man, lofty in his own um, esteem, he is abominable. And here, the devious are abominable. It turns God's stomach with righteous perfection. He hates that. But look at 32b. But he is intimate with the upright. He is intimate with the upright. And that's interesting because so many Christian mystics want some sort of experience, but they don't want the uprightness. There's not an appetite or an attraction to the uprightness. They just want the, this so-called intimacy. Uh, the so-called experience with God. This is what it means to experience God, believers. Growing constantly in holiness. That's what it means to experience God. He is intimate with the upright. Look at John 15, verse 14. We looked at this last week when we talked about friendship with the world, love of the world versus friendship with God, love of God. But let me remind you, John 15, verse 12, uh, I'm sorry, verse uh, 14, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Jesus says, you're my friends. This is a friendship, an intimate relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. We're his friends when we do what he says, obedience, uprightness, obedience, cleansing, purification, sanctification. That is a relationship with God. That is experiencing God. That's what it means to draw near to God. Look at 2 Corinthians. One more. Look at 2 Corinthians 6. In verse 14 to 18, you have that incredible paragraph that talks about um, the fact that there's no harmony and there's no camaraderie, really, between light and darkness, between um, sin and righteousness. Here's what Paul says in verse 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and, say to, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. I mean, the issue here is, if I'm going to be your God, you're my people, you need to separate yourself from people who worship other gods, because I'm holy, I'm distinct, I'm other, and you're, you should be just as holy and distinct and other as, as you are from the people who worship a God who's not like me. And so your life needs to be different. And so our holiness 
is our intimacy with God. That's what it means to be intimate with God. And so verse, so chapter 7, verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. It's true, it's true, the scriptures are full of passages that say, I am the Lord, I'm the one who sanctifies you. God is the God who sanctifies. It's also true. Just like our James passage, right here, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, the command to cleanse ourselves is active. We are actually active. We are obligated. We contribute to this issue of sanctification. We are actively involved in the cleansing, in the purification. And God is going to work that in a divine way through our active pursuit of all the commands and all the means of grace that he's given to us in the Christian walk. So cleanse your hands. Of course, the emphasis on cleansing your hands, go back to James 3, verse 8. The emphasis on cleansing your hands is, of course, that your your life, the overflow of your life ought to be pure. Cleansing, purifying your heart means that your inner, your inner man ought to be pure. And that would be pure thoughts and pure motives. Why you do what you do is pure. You do it for the right reason. You do it for pure reasons. You don't do it for impure reasons. And so it's important to take four, three, four, and five together. Number three, draw near to God. Number four, cleanse your hands. Number five, purify your hearts. And the last two we're going we're to be quick on here. Let's look at verse, verse nine. And that's my sixth, that's the sixth uh, command here on the path of humility toward a greater grace. Lament and mourn and weep. The NES has be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. This is an incredible verse because this verse just goes straight at the, the, the sentiment of our culture and the sentiment of our day that is always happy all the time, whatever makes you happy, whatever's thrilling, the next curiosity-seeking, entertainment, joy-gratifying type of pursuit, that's what we live for. And James just says, cut it out. Cut it out. Of course, he's not sitting there saying that, um, you know, somebody's walking around just moping all the time, like be or in your uh, demeanor. That's not, the, uh, the, that's not the command here. The command is, in light of, of your innate propensity toward worldliness, you should be miserable and mourn and weep. Jesus himself said, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are grieved over their sin, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven belongs to people who are characterized by mourning. Blessed are the the poor in spirit, spiritually destitute. Spiritually, I have no resources. I have no ability, and I mourn over my sin and my failure, and I go to the Lord empty-handed. That's humble, and that's appropriate. And so, I think verse 9 is really a helpful antidote to this current generation of Christian hedonists who are constantly looking for a way to approach the Christian life that won't cost them anything. We have an entire generation of Christians who want to actually succeed in the Christian life without ever having to say no to the flesh, without having to slit the throat on the monster of self-love. And we're called to put it to death. We're called to kill it, be killing sin, mortify sin, Uh, present tense, be killing sin, Romans chapter 8, Colossians chapter 3. It's an ongoing process for the Christian. And you come to verse 9, and it's just so counterintuitive to the the Christian hedonist, where it's just all supposed to feel so amazing and feel so awesome. And, um, um, you know, I've said it this way. there's, 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 There's hardly, there's not always, I'll say it that way, there's not always a correlation between how I feel and how I'm doing spiritually. When it comes to my submission to God, my resisting of the devil, and my drawing near to the Lord, if you're, if you're a young Christian, hear me on this, you might imagine that you're just, you're kind of, you, sometimes we, we, have, we have, have this carrot in front of the horse, we have this token in front of us as Christians thinking, man, there's just some experience I'm going to attain to, and then all of a sudden the difficulty, the sanctification is just going to be easy. And sanctification is just going to be like, there's no, no more difficulty anymore. 
One, fr- one friend asked me, what does, it, what does it feel like, you know, to just like, you know, when, like when you're worshiping Christ, I'm like, what does it feel like? Well, it depends. I mean, some of, here, let me describe some of the most intense emotions that you could possibly imagine. Imagine you get into some sort of um, social debate, and there's other people watching, and you just come up with a zinger, and everybody thinks that was a hilarious, and man, you you're put that guy in his place, and you just felt amazing until the Lord convicted you of your wickedness. Or, imagine brokenness over sin, because you're seeing your sin, and that feels incredibly low. I mean, in that one little example, the highest emotional fever pitch is when you couldn't be farther from God, and the lowest emotional pitch, you couldn't be closer to God. And James 4.9 is a very helpful antidote to this emotive approach to the Christian life. If you want, if you want the emotion, well, then what's, what's the emotion that goes with verse 9? It would be a loathing of oneself that's described in Ezekiel no less than four times, Ezekiel 4, Ezekiel 16, Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 36. At the fulfillment of the new covenant, God says, you will loathe yourselves for how you treated me. That's, that's what it feels like. Draw near to God. Wow, Lord, I cannot... I cannot believe I did that. No, I should believe I did that. That's theologically actually accurate. That's who John Anderson is by nature. I'm so grieved that I did that. That's, that's where, that's the path to humility. That's the path toward a greater grace. That's what humility looks like. Finally, in verse 10, we come to our seventh, seventh command. Be humbled before God. You'll notice, be humbled. It's passive. Um, all the English versions that I looked at, and three of the German versions I looked at, all, all are active. Just humble yourself. And the Greek is just, it's undeniably passive. There's no debate. It's just, it's a grammar. It's not an interpretation. It's just, it's passive. Be humbled. And I think that's helpful to even read it that way. I think what's lost with the active is that it just sounds like there's, a, there's, this, there's this token that I need to hit, and then I have arrived. This is actually a passive command. So passive means... I'm not the one actively doing it. Somebody else is doing it to me. So God's the one who's causing the humility in this command. But it is still a command. It's an imperative. So there's obligation on me. So those two going together are really tricky to think about. It kind of blows our mind sometimes to think about a passive command. Okay, something has to happen to me, and I'm obligated to make sure that it happens to me. So what has to happen is I must be humbled before the Lord or in his presence. It's the same construction that you see in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. You remember what it says? NAS has, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. It's literally, be humbled under the mighty hand of God. So it's, it's the idea is, you're, you're placing yourself under God's mighty hand and you're staying there. Here, it's, I'm being humbled in God's very presence. And we're helped to understand what this passive command looks like by the last phrase, and he will exalt you. God is the one who's going to do the exalting. You must be humbled and then let God do the exalting. So what that means to passively be humbled is I place myself in a position where the circumstances that I would be after, I'm going to guarantee that if I get to those circumstances, it won't be because of me. Does that make sense? In other words, I know I'm obeying this passive command when I say, there might be circumstances I want to get to, and maybe, it's, maybe the exaltation is something that's actually, you think of like an exaltation, like at work, I got a, I got a promotion to the, to the next tier in the leadership of my business or whatever, or it might just be a circumstance that we find desirable, uh, marriage or a, a different job or whatever, or an undesirable circumstance, a, a circumstance that I want to avoid. Maybe that's what it means to be exalted. And to be humbled passively means I'm just going to place myself under the Lord's hands. I'm going to be humbled in God's very presence. And if that exaltation were to take place, it would only be because of the Lord, because humility says it's not going to be because of me. That's what it means to be humbled. God will exalt you. You leave that in his hands. You let him take care of 
the circumstances. You let him take care of the results. We just put ourselves on this path of these nine imperatives and these seven points as I listed them out for us to say, Lord, I, I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be proud at all. I want to be marked by humility. Thank you for giving me these clear instructions to remain on this path so that I can arrive at a greater grace. And the greater grace, of course, is a heart that's zealously devoted to the Lord. The greater grace is not the idols, it's not the lusts, it's not the longings, it's not the pleasures waging war in our members. It's none of that. It's a heart that loves God and not the world. That's the kind of grace we need. And that's the kind of grace that's promised in this path. Lord, thank you so much for this text. So, so helpful, Lord, just slowing down and even thinking about these, these nine commands and how important they are for us to be able to recognize what humility looks like and what it means to be on this path toward a greater grace. And so I pray that it would minister and encourage the hearts of your children this morning. And so we just pray, Lord, that this would bear tremendous fruit in this church and in this city for your glory and your glory alone. In your name we pray. Amen.